Anime come and go by the ass load every single season, with some of them bringing about some of the current best anime in existence, while others are just as good but are swept under the radar because watching every anime takes a lot of time, especially when you're caught up with other activities. <laughs> But accomplishing such a feat that consists of having no friends, never seeing sunlight, and pulling no bitches leads you to the real hidden gems, like the current most popular anime. Solo leveling, the thing on the same level of popularity as Kojo should re-meet the anime, is something that's managed to live up to the hype. Despite being very similar to your average power fantasy isekai, its animation, characters, and sheer amount of gore really set it apart from its contemporaries, because it's like, really violent. <laughs> The premise of the series is basic enough with this guy, Sung, uh, Woo, uh, Woo, Woo, I don't think this is Japanese. Becoming an adventurer to help his dying mother and cute sister, except he sucks total ass and can't even beat a goblin. Now, I'm no expert, but he can walk it off. So after foolishly fucking off to a dungeon with a group of other adventurers, instead of taking this cute girl on a date, everyone we just met dies, which, oh no, who would have seen that coming? And then he's left for dead only to wake up and be told to do the One Punch Man workout or perish. So he perishes. That's right, everyone just died so that he can become Saitama, but that's not all that dissimilar to most isekai we get every season. It's just that the difference here is that the man, uh, ma man, yeah, it's definitely not Japanese, has amazing art, causing everyone and their mother to rightfully have it up. And while the anime doesn't replicate that one-to-one, -one, its insistence to not use CG really helps to set it apart visually from everything else. And the staff working on the anime play to the strengths of the source material by removing what doesn't work, adding in much-needed context rather than info-dumping it later, and showing this guy get fucking evaporated. The manhwa shows that the series is more style over substance, and the anime doubles down on that with fantastic visuals in the opening and show proper, even if the latter is much weaker than the former. The story could very well be a larger and much stronger focus in the future, as hinted at in the ending by having Jin Woo question his new Matrix-like situation and trying to get to the bottom of whether his reality is even real and everyone else is just an NPC whilst he's one of the select few to break free from the programming and don the moniker of player, but I highly doubt it's gonna do any of that and will instead have its story be the anime equivalent of. There's nothing wrong with that per se, as writing the rule of cool can make for just as interesting a piece of media as one that actually makes you think. And not every piece of entertainment is beholden to the monogatari way of writing. While it is nice to know that the author put actual thought into their story and world, it's also just as fun to know that every scene the main character is in is the absolute coolest shit you've ever seen. At least after he awakens his alternate personality. I need the Max win. The fact that Jin Woo doesn't immediately become the badass figure most of us have already seen him as is actually to the series benefit, as many anime make the mistake of jumping right into the action and making the main character as overpowered as possible. And that not only ruins any and all future tension, but it also doesn't really feel earned and the audience doesn't relate much to the MC as a result. As opposed to works like Jobless Reincarnation, let me cook before you start laughing, please, where we know Rudy is OP, but he has to slowly work up to that while not being aware of it himself, and Solo Leveling seems to be doing the exact same thing, so it understands that the build-up and adventurer too badass with defining moments along the way, or what make for a fun, overpowered character story, especially when we can look forward to characters like this in the future. When a manga fake book or any other type of material that isn't Japanese cartoons gets popular enough, they get their own Japanese cartoon. Or a shitty live action one. <laughs> yeah, Avatar's fuck. Dungeon Meshi, also known as Delicious in Dungeon, somehow managed to get an adaptation by the esteemed studio Trigger, of which has been the only adaptation they've ever done for a TV anime, so of course they hired a YouTube editor to make it. While well, the anime adaptation is definitely not what anyone expected Trigger to do, it's very much in line with their love of shitposting, which sometimes takes the form of entire anime. <laughs> This has thus led to a bond between source and adaptation like no other, wherein they intrinsically understand the source material and use their talents to help amplify it. By making it look like shit, in all seriousness, while the series does look a bit cheap at times, that's part of the inherent charm of the anime that leans into the lovability and chaoticness of the characters, in a similar way to how Konosuba does with its bad animation. On the plot side of things, the entire anime is rather lackadaisical when it comes to anything resembling one, and is a much more character-focused show as a result, especially when considering you can't even cook any of the food. 
Oh yeah, let me just pop on down to Walmart and ask if they have elf penis. The staff over at Trigger understood this, thus making their decision to have the show look the way it does make even more sense. But they then double down on it as soon as the intro by having the anime start with the majority of the cast fighting for their life in the dungeon against an extremely powerful dragon, only for the main character to go, I'm really hungry. Before his sister then gets gobbled up after saving his ass, literally, allowing the main character and their other party members to narrowly escape the dungeon, after which the three remaining members embark on a quest to reach the floor they were just on as quickly as humanly possible in order to save the sister, which results in them having no time to procure food and, therefore, forces them to eat monsters that lurk in the dungeon, something highly unusual in this world, and his party members are rightfully against it, but while they're bitching and moaning about it, he's just like, I wonder what dragon pussy tastes like. The anime adaptation plays into that innate silliness of the characters and their traits, having their goofy moments be where most of the expressive animation goes into, rather than any actual battle themselves, oh my god, what happened? leading to an experience that focuses on the series' strengths rather than trying to make it something it's not, making the characters' unique personalities stand out all the more as you later find out that this world has a Dungeons and Dragons-like function where death isn't really permanent, so it becomes all the more apparent that Lyos, our main character, is only leading this expedition simply because he's a psychopath who cares more about eating monsters than he does his own kin, which is fucking hilarious. His inherent lack of empathy and disregard for anything that isn't monster cummies filling his belly makes his sheer existence absolutely hysterical, but the other characters are just as fun, with Marcel, the level 12, who exists only to be bullied, and to which puts her in the race for the best elf this decade, she ain't beating grandma, being an absolute joy of a character who's both relatable and amusing, and it's through her interactions with Lyos and the others that she and the rest of the cast really shine, showcasing how genuine they all are despite their quirks, which is perfectly exemplified in episode 2 when Marcel is getting bullied by monsters while everyone else just watches, and the new dwarf companion does all of the hard work instead, leading to Marcel feeling like she's not being helpful and pulling her own weight, thus forcing herself to leave her comfort zone and try to fetch ingredients on her lonesome, which she immediately fucks up. Aw, oh, shit. Okay. When Free Run aired, everyone thought it was going to be this slow, sad series about learning to come to terms with mortality, but then Free Run turned out to be an absolute savage. You guys Huh? It simultaneously fooled everyone who watched it and made really cringy videos talking about how sad it was. <laughs> I don't know who the f would do that. While also raising the bar for the fantasy genre in one fell swoop. With action animation so smooth it's above any of its contemporaries to every element of the anime that comes together so well that it sets a new standard for what the medium is truly capable of. Because there's no other anime that animates ass fabric this well. Which is why you should like the video. It manages to consistently drag you into its world with each passing episode and it really picks up from its once dour message about mortality after it sets up the plot four episodes in and becomes more of a fantasy epic with the utmost care put into portraying it exemplified best not just in the animation but the lesser more missable touches that the anime team adds to the production such as the demons always having soulless eyes the eye movement of the characters themselves feeling very realistic fern telling me the truth as well as animation and movement matching the voice acting with the lip flaps themselves being hand drawn throughout the entirety of episode nine drawing lip flaps in such a way is not a thing majority of anime do because it just takes way too much time, but Free Rin matches each spoken syllable to animation, thus creating an uneven timing that catches the viewer's attention, even if subconsciously, to create a unique feeling that is absolutely f***ing wild and makes the anime stand out all the more, even when it was already stealing the show with its amazing art and backgrounds. The view from here is nice, isn't it? Stark, what the f*** are you talking about? This looks like a Bob Ross painting. Such subtleties mixed with the tone of the voice acting in certain scenes make for a nice dash of realism and side of a fantasy anime, helping to make it feel distinctive and, despite not being a predominantly action-packed show at first, it's proved that it's certainly going to be a larger part of the series moving forward, of which, ironically, is what the anime does best despite appearing otherwise, with the insistence to have every movement of the characters feel realistic and weighted, as if coming from real, moving people, giving it a touch of gravitas I've never quite seen in an anime before. There's certainly more facets of the production that make the anime as good as it is, like the expert level sound design and doing something as basic as a character's voice trailing listlessly to one speaker when talking to another character as they move slightly to the right, something that's only impressive due to how many other anime don't do that, whether it be from lack of time, thought, or passion to put so much effort into one singular thing. Ultimately, however, while it's all components of the production that make this adaptation as good as it is, it's the writing and visual storytelling that stand out the most, as the two tied together a knot so neat that it encompasses the rest of the anime, transcending it from an adaptation of a pre existing manga to something worth experiencing on its own right. Nice. <laughs>
When an anime tops the charts and lands the number one spot, that's how you know it's a great one. But when an anime consistently tops six different charts in a row for the first time ever in anime history for several weeks, and is slowly climbing its way up to number one with every passing day, then that's how you know you're dealing with peak fiction. Fuck, I have cancer. The Dangers of My Heart has continued to crawl its way into my top three anime of all time since it aired last year, and its second season hasn't let up in that regard, with absolute peak episodes every single week that somehow just keep getting better and better. It's the type of anime you watch thinking it's gonna be a fun ride, only for it to absolutely floor you with just how good it ends up being, to the point that it's arguably the best romance anime I've ever had the pleasure of laying my eyes upon. And not just because she's hot. You disgust me. It manages to craft a connection between two characters so naturally that you'd forget you were watching anime, were it not for the six foot tall giant with tits bigger than my face. She's 14, by the way. And that in and of itself is a feat very few anime have managed to accomplish. But when you then combine that with a supporting cast that's not only hilarious, but also feel like actual real people who have an existence outside of the plot, yet also exist for it, then then you start to ask the question, is this a masterpiece? Dumbass, disrespectful question. If the anime managed to fly under your radar, then it's time to give it a shot. Because while the plot does seem like the typical boy meets girl and they dick around for the next three seasons, which is exactly what it is, it's also so much more than that and touches on aspects few other romance anime attempt to, like what exactly a genuine relationship is. And while there's certainly some cringe in the first two episodes that's bound to turn people away, they're not bad in and of themselves, and it's the type of anime that quite literally just keeps improving with every episode, so it's worth getting through them to get to moments like this. <laughs> Lord have mercy, I'm about to bust. Unlike most romance anime though, the story isn't as episodic as it initially seems, and that's what really separates it from its contemporaries, as it never wastes time on filler episodes to prolong the inevitable and instead uses each individual episode to portray new aspects of our two leads, Yamada and Ichikawa, as they learn more about one another and grow together, progressing the plot that is their relationship every single time. Even though I'll never have that. The progression from strangers to Oregon Book is the most natural I've ever seen from an anime, of which I touched on more in my original video, but what's really impressive is how much we start to learn about the characters because of it. With Ichikawa getting the main focus in season one, as Yamada breaks away the armor he donned to shut people out. That being the creepy, I wanna murder her attitude that drives away so many would-be fans in the first episode, which is the equivalent of dropping JJK because of the hot men, which honestly couldn't be me. <laughs> Likewise, season two is Yamada's time to shine, thus we learn more of her own inferiority complex and how she feels that everyone around her is so much better than her and that she's constantly letting them down no matter how hard she tries. And it's that trait mixed with Ichikawa's own lack of self-confidence that serves to illustrate the fact that they're not only much more alike than they think, which is basically the entire point of season two, but to also make their relationship feel all the more real. Rather than just being focused on the will they won't they, the anime opts to tackle each lead's interpersonal problems and show how they both help the other to overcome them. Whether it be Yamada chipping away at Ichikawa's armor by constantly hanging around him, which you'll never have, or Ichikawa helping Yamada to realize that she has a genuine passion for acting, something she couldn't put into words herself, which not only makes her respect him all the more, but also causes Ichikawa to realize that Yamada isn't Yamada if she isn't always trying to be her best self. So he encourages her to continue when given the choice to run away from it with her, despite it meaning that he has to put himself in uncomfortable situations. <laughs> God, I wish that were God, me. I wish that were him. Actively helping one another grow is exactly what a genuine relationship is. Two people who share a natural chemistry that are always propping each other up and helping become better versions of themselves because of how much they care for and look up to one another. Feeling like they can't exist without them, literally. And that's what the entire anime drives home, that they genuinely love and depend on each other. To the point where Yamada could confidently say that she had someone else she liked, even in front of Ichikawa, and that's fucking sick. Cinema. Yamato, I love she cries at first because it's painful and she feels as though she's not good enough so Ichikawa may not reciprocate, but they quickly become tears of happiness as soon as the following episode when Ichikawa calls her cute. Oh no, I have kids. Not only would none of it have been possible without this seemingly random character's existence, but they were also all necessary steps that had to happen before the inevitable confession. And it's things like this that put the writing in a tear all its own, with the payoff to those moments being as good as they are not only because of the lack of fillerish episodes, but also because of the spectacular anime adaptation. 14, by the way. 
The direction and OST specifically knock it out of the park, as the director naturally builds up to those bigger moments while nailing the in-between perfectly, whether it be comedic, serious, or romantic, which is extremely impressive considering how tough it is to do just one of those things correctly, let alone balance three very different things so masterfully. And the OST is the cherry on top with just how well it fits the series. It's unassuming and isn't much at first, but it slowly starts to mellow you out in the background while drawing your attention to what's happening on screen, subtly building your emotions to the bigger moments as the tracks themselves swell in intensity and all the facets of the show come together to form a symphony of peak. Kimi ga po 